Good morning, one and all. Good morning, little fella. Where's your mummy? You better go to find your mummy. Anyway, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to worship service and study service at, here at South Brisbane on this particular Sabbath day. We're, uh, we're blessed to have a guest speaker who we've uh, already valued what is presented about dinosaurs in the Bible in Sabbath school. So uh, <coughs> this uh, program that he'll present during the main service here will, I'm sure, lift our faith and our, uh, reinforce our faith and uh, give us some good ammunition to share with other people as well. Um, who are we up here? Well, uh, who we're talking, the main um, presenter of the day of, is Dr. Taz Walker. Welcome, Taz. <coughs> He's intro already introduced himself fairly well in, uh, in the uh, Sabbath School program. But uh, <coughs> Taz represents the Creation Ministries International program, which um, it's quite a, a vibrant program. It's actually based here in, in Brisbane, isn't it? Is that the worldwide base? Eight mile plains. No, Australian base is here. It did start it's, here in Australia. Yeah, it started here in Australia. And um, so they have a, a vibrant ministry with magazines and, and things. And for those who stay for lunch, there'll be a display of things that you can look at up, up there in, in the lunch room or close to there somewhere, I think. Um, so we look forward, Taz, to your, uh, your presentation. And serving with me up here is Rhonda, Rhonda Bundy. Um, Rhonda's a, a prayer warrior and uh, a lovely lady and a, and a mother and, and wife. So uh, welcome, Rhonda, and my name is Doug Friend. Uh, I think that we, we pray, our church prays, on a regular basis for one family each week. And um, that family this week is a high profile family. Uh, Chris Dupree, who's the gentleman standing there down at the, who was standing a minute ago, is now hiding. Uh, and uh, Leticia and uh, Tia and Amelia, who's doing a dance down there, and uh, Lisa as well. So uh, we're blessed to have them as part of our family and we'll be praying for you this week. Over to Rhonda. Good morning and happy Sabbath. You know, um, it's beautiful to know that God created us in his image and he gave us voice. So now I want to ask you all to lift up your voice and let's give praise to our God. Our first theme that we're going to sing today is praise to the Lord. Even number one. Amen. 
Those who are able to kneel, let's kneel down and pray. <clears throat> Dear loving Heavenly Father Yahweh, King of King, Lord of Lord, mighty God. Lord, we lift up our hearts to you in love and adoration, for you are great. Lord, we give you praise. We give you honor and glory this morning because you are worthy of praise, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful morning that you have given us to come and worship you, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Lord, we humbly come before you, before your mercy throne, to seek your forgiveness because we have let you down in our words, in our thoughts, and in our deeds, dear Lord. Please forgive us and accept us as we are. Lord, we thank you for looking after us and taking care of us and protecting us throughout the week, dear Lord. You have clothed us. Lord, you have provided a roof above our head. And Lord, you have given us good health and you have sustained us. And Lord, thank you for guiding our coming ins and going out, Lord. Thank you for being the tower of our strength and place of our refuge when we were facing with struggles in our lives daily, dear Lord. Lord, this morning, I wanna say thank you, Lord, for welcoming all the visitors and friends and family members that are coming to our church today, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for opening your loving and mighty hands to them when they were walking through that door. Lord, may you bless them and be with them, dear Lord. Lord, I pray for those who are not here today as well. Whether they're sick or whether they're at home, wherever they are, Lord, may you bless them. May you have protection over them. Lord, may you draw closer to them, dear Lord. Lord, this morning, I just want to say thank you, Lord, for you giving us this opportunity at South Brisbane Church to pray over our family each week. Our prayer family for this week is Dupree's family, dear Lord. What a lovely family, dear Lord. We've been blessed. Through, you have blessed us through them, dear Lord, individually and through our church, dear Lord. Thank you, Lord, for continuing to be with them, and Lord, a protection over them. Lord, I pray for um, Mom Leticia, Dad Chris, and three beautiful girls, Tia, Amelia, and Lisa, Lord. Lord, I commit them into your hand as they continue to love you, as they continue to depend on you, and be with you all the days of their lives, dear Lord. Bless them today. Lord, I thank you for this program today, dear Lord. Dear Lord, there's so many things out there in this world, dear Lord, that's full of lies and deceits, dear Lord. Things that are natural becoming unnatural. Things that are nat unnatural becoming natural. Things that are good becoming bad, bad becoming good. That's a world that we're living in right now, dear Lord. And Lord, we pray that, and also Lord, our enemy Satan is creating counterfeits of what beautiful things that you have created for us, Lord. Lord, I pray that may you open up our hearts to receive your word and your truth, dear Lord. Help us to listen to your voice, dear Lord. May your Holy Spirit lead us into the worship, dear Lord. Lord, this morning I pray for Dr. Tess Walker, dear Lord. May you bless him and give him the wisdom that he needs and speak through, to us through him, dear Lord. And Lord, may you bless our worship today as we worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. 
Lord, in your sweet, holy, and wonderful name. Of Jesus we pray, amen. Children, all of you, Pastor Gideon has a story for you. Please come forward. and girls, morning children, and a morning, morning, good morning to all of our church family as well. I'm just um, pausing, oh there's my son here, up here too. Well thank you for being so brave, walking all the way up to the front uh, for this children's story. How many of you guys like dinosaurs? Everyone's hands almost is going up, that's awesome, because I didn't really like dinosaurs, but you know what, my four-year-old son he knows every dinosaur that there is, and he's taught me more in the last year about dinosaurs. But you know what? We actually had a really great presentation just this morning, and it was given by Dr. Taz, and it was on dinosaurs. So you might be able to look at that. And, um, and Dr. Taz, I was going to give shout out all the answers, but I wanted to make sure that everyone else had the chance to answer first, so I let them talk. Otherwise, you would have heard from me. But I reckon if these guys were sitting inside that presentation, they probably would have been given all the right answers as to um, what the different dinosaurs are. So I'm going to share with you a little story about a young girl, and she could have been even the same age as, as you. Okay, And there was a time when she, she lived near the coast, and she lived near the beach. And as you do, she came out, and there was a big storm the night before. And the storm had actually washed and, and, and raged all night and even through to the, to the day, to the morning. And there were starfish. They were all scattered all over the, the, the beach. And when she looked out, thanks for collecting all the starfish, guys, but you've just ruined my illustration. So anyway, I want you to just imagine there were heaps and heaps of starfish all the way across the beach, hundreds, maybe even thousands of different starfish. And as you know, starfish, they, they're like fish. They're fish. So they can't be out of the water for too long. And so she started getting them and throwing them back in the ocean so that they wouldn't perish, they wouldn't die. And someone was walking past her, and they scoffed at her, they sneered, they said, you know, you're not going to make a difference by, by all of those. You, you can't possibly save um, all of those starfish. You know, why bother? You can't make a difference. And she turned around to the person that made that statement, and she almost had like a look. I'm not sure what that look may have been. But she went back to the starfish, she picked up another one, and she threw it back into the ocean, just like the one you got in your hand, all right? Picked up the starfish, she threw it back into the ocean, into the big sea, and she said to the person, well, I made a difference for that one. And then she picked up another one, and she threw it back, and she said, I made a difference for that one. And soon, some of the people that were around her, that were a little bit, you know, puzzled and saying, don't waste your time, you're not going to make a difference, Soon they were picking up starfish and they were thrown back and there were so many of those starfish that were saved. And I was going to get you guys to pick, all, pick up all the starfish and throw them, but you've already done that. So you've already got all the starfish. Maybe you can share them around so that everyone can have one. There you go. You get to have one as well. And I want you to think of yourselves as like that little girl. You know, I want you to think of yourselves because when you have a best friend in Jesus and Jesus... Jesus is my best friend. Is Jesus any of your best friend? You have him as a friend. Yep, you know him. You talk to him. So when Jesus is your best friend, guess what? You can actually help someone else know Jesus. And by helping them to know who Jesus is and his amazing plan to save them, you can actually help them be saved. So you can be like that little girl and you can make a difference. And it could be one person. It could be a friend. It could be a schoolmate. It could be someone that you don't know. It could be someone that you meet, um, but you can make a difference and you can even help them to be saved. Yes, do you have a question? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, that's right. And you may have heard of the story again, but I want you to remember that you can be that little girl and you can make a difference. Sometimes it could be helping someone. Sometimes it could be making a difference by supporting them or giving them something or being kind or even offering a word of encouragement. Sometimes there's so many different words that get thrown out of different mouths in different places that they're nasty words and put down words and other words. But if you encourage and you lift up people and you tell them what a blessing they are and you're positive, you can be of difference in that way as well. Okay? So children, I want you to remember that you are valuable to Jesus. You're like that starfish. He loves you and he can help you to make a difference wherever you are, just like that little girl. Okay? Did everyone get a starfish? Okay. All right. Well, you can go out and you can uh, make a difference with that starfish when you go back to your seat. Thank you very much. God bless you all. It's good, good when you know you're helping. Um, okay, keep things short. Uh, the main offering today is not for local church expenses as it might have usually been, but it's a special love offering to support the ministries of Creation Ministries International that, who uh, Taz represents. And um, so that's a, a worthy cause promoting things parallel to things within our church as well. Deacons, please stand and we'll have a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we just pray for your blessing on these funds as they go to Creation Ministries International and we pray for your, your blessing on the, uh, the work they're doing to uh, turn people, turn the hearts of men and ch women and and, uh, and children to, to you through the Bible. Thank you in Jesus' name, amen. bless you just making sure that you can hear me as we had a great time at sabbath school this morning i enjoyed it everybody stayed awake and uh, we all learned something which is really cool so tonight to, this morning it's great to be here at south brisbane and this morning we just clicked the button we got hymn number 21 <laughs> i think that's for the closing one is it it is so we need the PowerPoint, which is good. 
My name's Taz Walker. I was born in Tasmania at Hobart, so I was thinking I'm glad I wasn't born in Queensland, which is cool. And uh, so we, we, the, we're talking about this morning about creation is a key to a rock-solid faith. Rock-solid. I, I was trained as an engineer and I worked with the electricity industry for many years, uh, but I, then I went back and studied geology. And so people tease me about that. They call me the rock hound, so I've got rocks in my head, those sorts of things. But I think the person who made up this uh, title, which is really appropriate, a key to a rock-solid faith. With our faith, we have faith, but it needs to be based on something. It's a, a, we can't see it. We, don't, we walk not by sight, but we walk by faith. And so it, with Creation Ministries, uh, our, our um, US office went to a university uh, some time ago and they interviewed students who were there. They were interested to find out how students were travelling, particularly students who grew up in the church and then were attending university. Because a lot of young people drop out of church when they start going to university or at upper years of high school. They seem to learn things in high school and, un and at university it makes them think that what they learned at church wasn't true. And so they interviewed these people at a DVD, which you can download somewhere. But uh, here's one of the guys they interviewed. They interviewed people who grew up in the church. And they asked this guy, he said, oh, do you believe in biblical creation or do you believe in evolution? And he said, oh, I believe in evolution. He said, I'm studying biology at, uh, at this university and I believe in evolution. I said, well, so when you were grow growing up in church, did you ever get any information? Did you ever have any presentations or teaching about how science connects with the Bible? The evidence that shows that the biblical account of creation is scientifically true. He said, oh, don't recall ever having anything like that. And so then the next question was, so how are you travelling at the moment? Are you involved in a church at the moment? He said, oh, no, I don't really attend church now. And so he dropped out. And so he didn't get any teaching growing up in church. He dropped out when he encountered a different worldview at university. And here's another example of a, a lady, who, same thing, do you believe in biblical creation or evolution? She said, I believe in, uh, in biblical creation. So you, you study uh, biology, don't you? She says, yeah, but I believe in creation. So did you ever get any teaching at, at uh, church about science and how it connects with the Bible? Oh, yeah, we often had things at youth group or in church. And so, so how are you traveling at the moment? Are you um, connect, uh, in, involved with the church? And she said, yeah, yeah, I go every week. And that was a consistent story that um, basically of 100 people, a lot of them, more than two-thirds of the young people who grew up in church were no longer attending. But of those that were, it was almost without a, 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 a exception that they'd been re received teaching when they were at, at, uh, at church about the connection of science and the Bible and the authority and reliability of the Bible. So this lady, she had a, she had a foundation. And, and so when she encountered a different worldview at, at uh, university, her, her, her faith withstood. She already had the foundation. And I shared this at the Sabbath school. And if you saw this, it'll be good. You probably know it off by heart now. 1 Peter 3.15 Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. This could be somebody that you meet at the supermarket. It might be somebody, one of your neighbours when you go for a walk. Or it could be your, your son or your daughter when they come home from school. Or it could be one of your grandchildren that they ask a question about the, uh, how, how, they can, how you can believe the Bible and, and questions and doubts that they have that come up with. And so, uh, and as I mentioned at the Sabbath school, for those who are thinking, well, where can I get answers that are reliable? One good place is creation.com. It's a website. And it's got lots of articles on there. So if you're looking for answers, if you've been asked questions, you can go there and search box. You'll be able to find answers to lots and lots of questions, almost anything that you'll be asked. 
And if you sort of think, well, I, I, how can I keep up with this? Well, there's a newsletter, a free email newsletter. It's free. It's something that you can get into, you know, delivered to you. And it keeps you up to date, stuff that appears on the news, new findings that occur. And so you can keep up to date with this free email newsletter. And that's what Creation Ministries is about. Our, our aim is to provide answers to the challenges that come against the Christian faith today. And there are a lot of challenges, aren't there? It's basically 24-7 that occurs. So the thing is, to, to get a strong Christian faith, to have a strong foundation, a rock-solid faith, you need to be able to have a proper perspective on the world. And, uh, and it means looking at the world through Bible glasses. So the glasses that we look with depends on what glasses they are, how we see the world. And I... Sh I don't think I showed this at the um, uh, Sabbath school, but it's uh, the evidence. There's the dinosaurs. There's the dinosaur fossils. And you're looking at these dinosaur fossils, and there's various ways you can look at them. You can look at them through the lens of evolution, which is where, the way the, um, you know, the museum presents the information, the way the high school prevent, pre presents the information, the lens of evolution, and it's very hard in our culture to hear of any other way of looking at things. Or you can start looking at things through the Bible lens. And growing up in church, being part of this church, you would, receive, you know, you would have, had, and being part of the Sabbath school, you would have had a lot of experience of learning and being able to look at things through Bible glasses. And so rock solid foundation, creation is the foundation, and it actually is a foundation to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus starts with creation, actually starts with it. For example, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, talking about Jesus, and it's got, talking about the gospel. It says, For by him, for by Jesus, were all things created. All things were created by Jesus. Uh, one occasion, a number of years ago, after the service, a young lady came up to me and she was so excited. She said that she realized today that Jesus was the creator. <laughs> That's what it says. For, for by Jesus all things were created. And notice the word all. All things. All things were created by Jesus. And then, just in case you didn't get it, it goes on to say things that are in heaven and that are on earth. That's all things, isn't it? And, uh, and then it goes on again. Things that are visible and invisible. That's all things again. I think that covers it all. And whether they be thrones or dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created by him, by Jesus, and all things were created for him, for Jesus. So that includes me. That includes you. We were created by him. He knows us. He knows how we're made. And he's got a plan and purpose for our lives. And so that's what it says. And of course, where do you find out about how Jesus did it? Does it tell us anywhere how he did it? Yes, he did it. He did it in seven days. He did it, created in six. He rested on the seventh, he created on the seventh day. And we see that in Genesis chapter one. And so when you start with the word of God, it provides a, a way of looking at the world. It gives us information we wouldn't have known about before. There's no way we would have known about this unless God told us. And there are different things on different days, on day one, on day two, on day three, the earth was covered in water. And uh, it says that the, on day one, the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. On day three, God said, let the waters be gathered into one place. And it was so. So God spoke and it was so. And, and then the God's, a dry land appeared and God said, let the earth bring forth vegetation. Amazing things, beautiful trees to look at. And then there's trees which have got fruit on them. And in the fruit there's the seeds. So you can plant them and make more seeds. Isn't that incredible how that happens? Amazing. And I sometimes uh, play, I, I uh, talk a bit about teaching, or uh, if I have an opportunity to speak to primary age ch uh, children, I'll talk about this little particular, how God created, and I'll say things like, so... When did kangaroos first appear on the earth? When did that happen? When did kangaroos first appear on the earth? And then some young lad will put his hand up and he'll say, Day six. 
That's, that's what you'd say, is it? Day six. And then I'll say, but the Bible doesn't even mention kangaroos. It doesn't even mention them. So where do you get the idea that the, uh, that the kangaroos appeared on day six? And they'll say something like, the, well, the kangaroo is a land animal. All the animals that live on the land were created on day six. Yeah, that's exactly right. So even though it doesn't mention kangaroos, we can know about kangaroos because of what the Bible tells us. And then I kept going a bit more, and then eventually I say, so what about dinosaurs? When did dinosaurs first appear on the earth? And uh, that somebody will say, day six. Same reason. Dinos dinosaurs, and you know, the Bible at that place doesn't talk about dinosaurs. And... Uh, but it does talk about the animals that live on the land. Dinosaurs lived on the land, so dinosaurs are on day six. Isn't that amazing? Along with the other animals. It's just like any other animal. There's nothing special in some ways about dinosaurs, excepting that we don't see them today. But there are other animals we don't see either. We don't see the dodo birds, and there's other animals that have gone extinct. And so dinosaurs are on day six. And then I'll say, so where, what else appeared on day six? And they'll think, and then someone will say, People, people appeared on day six. And uh, I say, that's exactly right, people. And the first man and the first woman appeared on day six. And so then I say, that means that dinosaurs and people lived at the same time. And you can see, particularly because kids have always heard that dinosaurs died out millions of years before people came on the earth. And they think, it doesn't make sense. Dinosaurs, people living at the same time, and you can see them wrestling with that thought. But that's what the Bible says, and, we, and there's inf evidence of that. There's a brochure that we have. I think we mentioned it. It's actually at the table where the, the, the resources are displayed out there, and there's a free brochure that's there about dinosaurs. And the, and the brochure says, Do you believe dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago? And if you ask somebody that, they'll say, oh, yeah, or, oh, I don't know, maybe, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's interesting to ask people that question. And then inside the brochure, there's evidence of dinosaurs and people living at the same time. Lots of amazing evidence. So that's what it means. Dinosaurs and people lived at the same time. And, and that's how God created people. He said, let us make man in our image. And uh, th that's how God created, to have dominion over the earth. He created man to rule over the earth. And uh, that was his plan right at the beginning. And so he created Adam. That's an interesting story about that. And how he created Eve uh, from Adam's side. That's an interesting story too. But to rule over the earth. And so our kids, this is a kid's book, a picture out of a kid's book. So I hope you don't mind a little picture like this. But... Here's Adam naming the animals, and that's an act of ruling. You know? And so Adam ruling over, the, over everything that God created, he's naming, giving them names, and that's what people do. Parents give their kid children names, and uh, people in the government give the places names, the council give names to things. And so Adam's giving names to the animal, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe, and Mr. and Mrs. Dog, Mr. and Mrs. Rabbit, Mr. and Mrs. Dinosaur, dinosaurs were there, remember? Uh, but there was no Mrs. Adam, and so the really good story of how God created a woman, first man, a wife, a helpmeet for, that, for the man, and uh, how they be the first man and the first woman, which is really cool. And so that's creation, how God created, and how we can understand about ourselves, we can understand about marriage, we can understand about our role in this world, we can understand about the world. And that's what the God does. It provides a foundation for our faith. But then, you know, I don't know if you've heard of this guy called Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's a, an astrophysicist. Has anybody heard of him? Some people have. Yeah, and he's a, he's a very well-presented fellow. There's a lot of shorts uh, on, on video shorts that he makes, and he talks about lots of things. And, and because he's so well known and because he's a scientist and astrophysicist, people will ask him, uh, they'll ask him things like, oh, do you believe in a higher power? You know, do you believe in God? And, and Neil deGrasse Tyson will say, well, he will say, every account of a God that I've heard always talks about this God, this creator God, as being benevolent, being kind and loving. He said, but when I look at all the ways that the universe is trying to kill us, 
So I don't see any benevolent God out there. In other words, he doesn't believe in God. And so he got a, on one of his videos, he's got a picture of all the ways that the universe is trying to kill us with volcanoes and asteroids and tsunamis. And, and, we, see awful, and there's, we see awful things happening in the world, don't we? There's a terrible fire just recently and then there's you know, lightning bolts and things like that. And a lot of people ask that question, if God is good, you know, why doesn't he stop the suffering in the world? Why are there bad things in the world? And there's an answer to that question, but it goes back to creation. It goes back to the fall, to Adam and Eve. Because as Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, God uh, told Adam, and uh, he told Adam actually, that uh, you can free to eat from the fruit of any tree in the garden, but you're not to eat from the, fr the fruit of that tree there, in the middle of the garden. And uh, so, uh, but uh, Adam and Eve, well, that's Adam and Eve ate from the fruit. And that's what brought bad things into the world. We live in a world which is broken and decayed and sad today. And I talked to Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'd sort of referring to these glasses. I'd say, Neil, you know, you're looking at the world through these evolution glasses. That's the worldview that got up. That's your perspective. And it doesn't make sense. You can't understand God from that perspective. Neil, you need to change your glasses and look at it through the Bible lens. And so I point, of course, him to the creation, to the fall, and uh, understanding that it was by one man, Adam, that sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And that's the answer, isn't it? That's the Bible answer. That's why Jesus came and he died on the cross to pay for our sins. And so you see that creation is indeed a foundation to the gospel of Jesus. And in the New Testament in Romans, again it says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. We live in a creation which is spoiled, which is broken, which is under the, the, the heel of the, the enemy. And no wonder we have troubles in it. And so, but people, and, and I think Neil would understand that, but a lot of people would say, yeah, I can understand what the Bible says, but how can I accept the Bible when science has proved that it's wrong? You know, when the, the science you know, says the world is millions of years old, how can I accept the Bible even though I think it makes sense? Well, the thing is, we need to, th we need to figure out and to, to get sort out the so-called science. And uh, I just want to put up a picture here which illustrates science you know and that's what creation ministry is about it's providing answers to these questions so here's an example of science here's a guy he's a paleontologist so young men a paleontologist is a guy paleo means old he it doesn't mean he's old it means he looks for old fossils and he's found this old dinosaur fossil right that's why, and so here he is digging it up. That's what it looks like. Now, this is the secret. Most people don't know this, is that when he digs it up, it does not have a label on it which says, I'm 70 million years old. No label. He just digs up the bone. And that's the, that's the evidence. So the bone is the evidence. People say, I like to depend on evidence. Well, there's some evidence. That's the evidence. But the, the, the date there, 70 million years, that's an interpretation. That's not evidence. That's an interpretation. That's a story. That's speculation. Where does that come from? Did anybody measure it? No. It comes out of a people's beliefs, what they believe about the world. And so that's where, how we work it out. So uh, how, how do we work out, you know, our young people have faced this when they have to study at high school and university. They're always encountering stuff and things they've not heard before. And so they think, you know, how do I know what's true? You know, they told me that fish came out, uh, uh, you know, uh, evolved legs and came onto the land 300 million years ago. How do I know that's true? I've seen the fossils. Yeah, well, how do you know? You ask the question, what did they actually see? Science is about evidence, right? What did they see? What did they measure? What did they observe, right? 
So in this case, here's the guy with the bone. That's what he saw. That's the evidence. And so he didn't see the date. So, young people, you know that that's a story that they're making up. And so when they're making up a story, you think to yourself, well, I can make up a different story, one that fits with what the Bible says. And so that's how we work out what is fact and what is not fact. That's such a very powerful and simple thing. I, I tell my kids, look, don't stress about it. Don't, my grandkids, don't stress about it. Basically, you just look at it and you think to yourself, what did they actually see? You don't have to challenge the teacher. You can if you want to. But at least you're comfortable knowing what's true and what's not. And so this applies to so many things that, the, that children are learning in school and they have to learn in, uh, about it as part of the curriculum. For example, this is a textbook that's used in government schools. It's a Oxford University Press put this one out. Australian curriculum. This is year 10 science. And uh, that's when they learn about evolution. But they learn about it much, much earlier. Preschool, they start learning about it. And so they've got a little section there which is particularly relevant for young people who are thinking about themselves. Where did I come from? Why am I here? What's my purpose in life? And so they've got this little page which starts about human evolution and they call it the rise of the bipedal ape. The bipedal ape. So young people, if you're wondering about where you came from, you came from apes. And uh, basically, you know, you learned to walk on two legs millions of years ago. And so they've actually got the evidence for it. Here's some evidence. What they used to look like. And it's not that way at all. These are Photoshop drawings. They just make it look like that because they want to convince the young people that it's true. And it's actually not true at all. And, and, but then they've got this thing here, like showing how apes evolved into people. Have you seen this diagram? It's a very powerful diagram. And so even if little Johnny can't read, he knows the story of apes evolved into people, and, uh, which is pretty amazing. But I, I won't go into it all. You go to creation.com and each of these particular ones, you can look it up there and there'll be articles about it showing why it ain't necessarily so. But basically what they've done is they've arranged these things, two apes, Two apes, they've put two apes there at the beginning and at the end they've got three humans. And all these are basically within the human variation including Neanderthal and Homo erectus. They're all basically very, uh, within the human uh, humans, uh, kind. And then we've got the one in the middle which is Homo habilis which is widely regarded now as being invalid. That the, the paleontologists mixed up the fossils. They put fossils from apes and fossils from humans, they put it in the same basket and they gave it a name, Homo habilis. And now most paleontologists, many paleontologists, think it's invalid. So you've got this powerful diagram and they don't say in the schools, they don't say in the textbook, they don't give you this information. It's just to convince kids that we evolved from apes and it's actually not true. And I enjoy doing that putting a big red X through it. And there's a brochure out there about the two-tone twins, and that's on the tables there. And that's got this diagram in it and a lot of information about it, which you can find. It's a free brochure that's there. So you see, that doesn't make sense, but it's particularly, if kids pick this up, if they think it's true, if they think it disproves what the Bible says about Adam and Eve, it's going to rattle their faith, isn't it? They're going to think that you know, what they learned at, at uh, Sabbath school is not true. And so that's why it's so important to have it. It also makes uh, children, you know, if they, if they start to accept this, this is what it, how it happens. Basically, the kids will say, you know, uh, your, it says here, your science class went for ages and you seem a little bit down. What happened? It says, well, today the teacher said that we're nothing special. We're just highly evolved apes. So, wow, what are you going to learn in your next class? Is it, is it there? We're just highly evolved apes. What are you going to learn in your next class? Self-esteem. <laughs> Self-esteem. And, and depression is a major issue for young people these days, more so than it's been in the past. Now, when we're talking about creation, 
there are lots of questions, lots and lots and lots of questions that come up. And that's why Creation Ministries, we've tried all sorts of ways to try to get information out so that people can get answers to the questions they have. When I started there, we had basically, they were books which were sort of books for people who were at university. And so anybody else would not be able to understand them. And so over the years, we've gradually got books for younger people. We've got a magazine which is for families. And we've got lots of children's books out now. And so you'll be able to see those over there. But there's, uh, but, and the website, we make the website available so people can get answers to the questions that come up. Now, I, I was at a meeting just recently, and before the meeting, there was a lady sent me a, an email, and she had a whole list of questions in this email, which I tried to do. And I'm going to just show you what the questions were, and I answered them, and then I spoke to her afterwards, because her son is going through a real upheaval in his life and questioning things and not sure what to believe. And so she's wanting to get answers and so she asked if I could give them some answers. So these are some of the questions. One of the questions is, does natural selection prove evolution? You know, natural selection is a fact, isn't it? Doesn't that prove evolution? Well, no, it doesn't. Uh, and there's a brochure out there about, there about, do you know the difference between evolution and natural selection? And then, is, if, is chimps DNA similar to humans? Have you heard that? That humans and chimps, that uh, our DNA is 98% the same. So that means that we evolved from apes. There's the proof. Uh, and you see it when you go to the zoo. A, a, a chimp cage will have 98%. You see it everywhere. And this is the question that her son was asking. Is chimp DNA similar to humans? The short answer is no. They're quite different. And even if they were, it still wouldn't mean they evolved. And the next question is, does quantum physics prove the Big Bang? Well, you've got quantum physics. What in the world is that? And the Big Bang, what's that? It's such a big words that uh, it's, it really throws everybody for six. And I answered that, but basically the answer is no. It, uh, because... The Big Bang is about how everything came from nothing. And that doesn't work at all. And are dating methods reliable? I've heard about radioactive dating. Isn't that reliable? Don't they prove that the world is millions of years old? The answer is no. And I did a big re report. It went on for, I don't know, five or ten minutes uh, showing about how dating methods work. And there's a free br brochure out there about dating methods called, you know, How Dating Methods Work. And it shows you that even the scientists don't believe them, but they don't tell you that they don't believe them. And they write their papers in such a way that, that you think that it just measured it, and they didn't. And so are dating methods reliable? No, the answer is no. And the, the, there's the, the biblical way of providing the ages of people, eyewitness news, is the most reliable. And is Genesis poetry? I don't know if you've heard people say that. But they say, but you know, Genesis is not meant to be taken literally. It's not meant to explain how God made the world. It's just poetry. And, and that's what people say these days. And, and so there's lots of articles on creation.com about that. And so I had to explain that. But even if it is poetry, doesn't mean it's not true. There's lots of examples in the Old Testament about poetry, which describes a real event. And you can tell in, say, some translations, they set... There's a little bit of poetry in Genesis, about three or four lines of it. That's about all. And you can tell what's poetry and what's not. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's not true. What the Bible says is true. So I just wanted to put this up to indicate that this is a big issue. And to get on top of it, it's going to take, you know, it's going to be enjoyable. But it, you're going to need to get information. Now, there's a guy. <laughs> I love this guy. His name is uh, Matthew Shaw. He, he, he used to connect with the Creation Ministries website page and uh, I got this picture off the website and he made a comment and he said this, he says, I've been reading creation stuff for years. So he's, he says, I'm actually in year 12 and uh, I find that I'm acing my year 12 science because of <laughs> what he reads in Creation magazine. And then he says, specifically evolution. In year 12, they do really a lot about evolution in the science. And he says, I'm acing my year 12 evolution science because of Creation magazine. He says, I seem to know more about it than my teachers. <laughs> 
because they don't teach him the stuff, teach the teachers at university what kids learn in Creation Magazine uh, when they're reading about evolution and what you pick up in that brochure about the difference between evolution and natural selection. And so that's why we're really excited and, and always want to encourage people to say, well, look, if you're looking for ways to sort of uh, protect your children, protect your family, or if your family's gone astray, if you're looking for ways to help them come back, a creation magazine would be a really good way to do that. And uh, it, 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 it covers all the issues and it reinforces from year to year, from week to week. So here's another picture from the museum of this great dinosaur fossil. Did anybody ever see this fossil at the museum? Does anybody ever go to the museum? You do? But this was, it's, it's, it's still there, but it was right in the front some years ago. And it was a dinosaur fossil which was found at Mataburra. And they said it was roaming around Queensland 100 million years ago. And they called it a Mataburrasaurus. And amazing, isn't it? And, and uh, when you look at that, you know, I, I, I ask the young people, I say, what do you notice about it? And they tell me this and that and the other thing. I say, well, look, I'll tell you what I notice. I notice it's dead. Did you notice it was dead? And they laugh, because it's obviously dead. And, and so that's death and suffering and bloodshed. And they also f discover cancers on these things and that sort of thing, and which is evolution, which is death and disease and suffering. Over millions of years, that's how we came about, millions of years. But you know, the Bible, we've said it before, that if you're looking through Bible lens, that's, that's not the way it works. For the, the wages of sin is death. It's from sin. Sin leads to death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So this picture sets it out. Man's actions brought sin into the world. And so that raises a question about the fossils. And the answer to the fossils is Noah's flood. And so this Noah's flood is a key thing. And it was Noah's flood, a, a book about it in 1961, that basically was the first sort of stronghold, the first resistance against the evolution juggernaut that's going across the Western world. And a book called The Genesis Flood. And it describes the ark. The ark is uh, longer than a football field, 140 meters. This is a model. And uh, it had three decks, a bottom deck, a second deck, a third deck, higher than a four-story building, plenty of room to fit all the animals on, and, uh, and that and then it's uh, 15,000 tons of stable design. And there's the animals going on. We talked about that in dinosaurs this morning. And then the fountains of the great deep broke open. The door had been shut by God and the ark lifted up off the earth and lifted up and lifted up until every high mountain under the entire heavens was covered. And that means that the flood covered Brisbane, covered Australia, covered the, the uh, great... Uh, it covered the great dividing range. The waters covered the whole lot. And so and uh, everything that had the breath of life in it perished. And so when we look at this dinosaur in the museum, basically, what about it? It should actually have a sign which says, buried in Noah's flood. You know, people should at least have the opportunity to hear the idea, don't you think it should be? It shouldn't be censored out that you can't talk about it. You know, people have the... Should, it at least gives people the dignity and, and uh, appreciates their ability to be able to think, to be able to explain that this... Some people believe that this formed in Noah's flood. Noah's flood, actually, it washes away the millions of years. It was a catastrophe. And so we find, for example, in Australia, this, this is another amazing example of a swimming animal plesiosaur buried up near Richmond in the so-called Great Inland Sea. They're up there, uh, here it is, uh, up at Richmond the, here. And uh, buried quickly. The farmer found it on the property and these uh, paleontologists who were uh, excavating it, they said, there must have been some sort of a catastrophe here. <laughs> Why would they think that? Why would they think there was a catastrophe? Because the thing's buried. It's not been eaten by other animals, if it, if it died naturally, it, it would be eaten, it would be nothing left after a little while. And it, if it's going to be preserved, it has to be buried by a metre or more of sediment. Otherwise, 
it would all fill up with gas as it decays and, and pop out and float to the top. So you didn't hear that, boys, did you? Don't worry about it. Anyway, so it has to be buried by a lot of sediment, and that's why they said there must have been some sort of a catastrophe here, right up there in the Queensland, up in the north, and even the bones in, it, in its flippers were preserved. So there's the evidence for Noah's flood. You see it everywhere, and I'm just touching on a few things to sort of give you a little taste, to the sort of exciting things you can look into. You know, there was a, 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 a this is a, a gorge, a valley, a canyon. It's the 40th sky, size of Grand Canyon, and it's got a little creek. Can you see the little creek running down the middle of the canyon? Can you see that? And uh, you could, and it, look, it would have taken that creek a long time to carve that canyon. Long, long time to carve such a big canyon. But you know what? It wasn't the creek that carved the canyon. It was a mud flow. It was a mud flow where the uh, volcano erupted. It made all this mud which slid down the side and carved out that canyon in one day. One day. It didn't take years and years and years. And when you look at the uh, uh, around us, like here's the Three Sisters in Sydney, just, not, just near Sydney, and you look at them and you see, well, a, a guy who believes, a, 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 has trained at the university and believes that things happen slowly, he says, uh, a little bit of water over a long time. That's where the long time comes from. Now, he didn't see it happen. That's what he's thinking. But a person who believes the Bible says, a lot of water over a short time. See how it works? It's the same evidence. And, uh, for example, you look at it and you can see, for example, how flat the top is. See how flat it is? And uh, you wonder, how did it get to be so flat? Well, that fits when where the waters of Noah's flood covered the whole area. And uh, when they're covering the, all this region, it would plane the top flat. And then as the waters are going down, Noah's in the ark, wondering when the waters are going to go down, uh, the, the waters are running off in big, wide r rivers, huge, wide channels. And as the waters run through this wide channel, it's eroding the canyons out. And uh, it's much larger than the river that, that's there now. So it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? See how the creation, it provides a foundation for this rock-solid faith. And as I said, there's always lots of challenges. For example, uh, you look at diamonds. Diamonds take millions of years to form. How could the Bible be true? And this is what you learn and you see. Even if you buy a diamond ring, they talk about it at the jewellers, millions of years in the making. But you know, it's not true. What you hear, they can form quickly. Here's a guy is in a factory called Gemesis in the United States. They got these big steel containers and he, you put the carbon inside a cylinder in the container. You close the lid, you heat it up, Big pressure. And in four days, out comes a diamond. Isn't that incredible? It only takes four days. And so what they say is, we can do in four days what nature took millions of years to do. No, that's, that's an evolutionary way of looking at it. We did it in four days and shows that it, nature didn't need millions of years to do it. It only could have done it, it did it really quickly. So we've touched on a few things. I hope that's been encouraging for you about the fact I've, I've been, in a way, I guess I've been challenging you gently about being prepared. There's a battle going on in our culture and it's a political battle. There's a political battle going on. It manifests politically, but it starts deeper. It starts with the mind. It starts with teaching people things about the world and, and, and it's what's being taught in the schools, what's being part of our curriculum that children have to learn. That's where the battle goes on and it's basically God's word, God's creation versus it all happened by itself. We don't need God. God didn't do it. It just happened. And uh, so that's the, the battle that's going on. And so be prepared to give an answer to that. There was a guy called Robert. He sent us an email some time ago and he said, he said a few months ago, he said, I started on my high school geology course. Now, a lot, of yeah, a lot of boys like rocks and fossils and things like that, and he would have been like that, enjoying geology. And he said, my faith 
was weakened by the evolutionary arguments in the course. So here's a guy teetering on the edge, teetering on the edge because of what he's learning at school. He's sort of wondering, well, I can't believe what I learned at church. And he says, a few months later, he said, I received quite a few of your books for Christmas. And he says, I must say that these books, as well as the website, have greatly encouraged my faith. And so that's what we want to, you know, we have lifesavers down at the beach, which are looking out for people who get into trouble. And so that's what we need in the church. We need lifesavers who are trained and who are able to spot people that are having trouble and are able to step in and give some help. And of course, part of being able to do it, if you say, well, how can I be that? Well, if you know the name of the website, that's a great start. You will be greatly informed, be able to point people there for their questions. And you can get automatic training. If you go to get the newsletter and the guys have a, a, a board which has got, you can fill your name out and your email address on this board. that will be out there, they'll be walking around with these boards. So you can get the newsletter and so it comes out every couple of weeks and it really is great. It looks like something like that. And out on the table there's a, great, uh, there's a really amazing r- range of resources. Now we won't be, you won't be able to buy anything today you won't be, because we won't be selling today but you will be able to have a look and you'll be able to see what, you know, what appeals to you, what is relevant to you, so you'll be able to look. And one of the things you might be looking for is something that helps overall. And, and a, a great resource overall is the Answers book, which comes out, which covers you know, the, the whole gambit in one book. So it's like a reference book. There's another one called Evolution's Achilles Heels, which also deals with a whole wide range of things. And there's other books there as well. So just because you can't buy today, what we've done, what we're going to do, is I'll give you a code. It's a secret code. Well, it's not really secret, but it's uh, creation.com forward slash store. So you know about creation. You go to the store, and you can get 20% off all books with this code. Now, my name's Taz Walker, so it's TW. It's 2023, so it's 23. Today is August, August, it's 08, and it's the 26 today. Is that right? TW2308.26. So that's your coupon code for 20% discount. And it's valid until tomorrow evening at 11.59 p.m. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Until 11.59. So there you go. Don't leave it till the last minute. <laughs> anyway. So a guy called, there's another guy called Jeremy. This is, so you might like to go to the bookstop, which, the bookstore, which is at Acacia Ridge, uh, Eight Mile Plains, I should say. That's what it, you can have a look at it there. It, that's, uh, some people might like to do that. But uh, we had a guy that said, your writings played a big part in me becoming a Christian. He said, my older brother got me a subscription to Creation Magazine. So the magazine would probably be, if you're sort of saying, well, what would be the best thing to get? This would probably be the best because it covers everything. It's easy to read. It's family level. uh, It does different subjects, nice pictures. So there's all that, which means that if you leave it in the house, somebody will probably read it, you know, because it's, it's... And then after three months, there'll be a new one come in. And it'll all sort of... And and, uh, we hear stories from families where there's a a bit of a competition over who gets the creation magazine. So basically, there's a form out there, the guys will have it, you fill out the form with your name. If you fill out your name and address today, uh, uh, and we'll take it back to the office, and someone from the office can ring you so that you can pay for it next week. So creation is a foundational thing. It's It's a key to a rock solid faith for you and your family. And we read before, we read this uh, Col- Colossians 1.16. It says, For by Jesus were all things created. Isn't that good? Things are in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. All things were created by him and for him. So I hope that sort of sets you off on a great journey. A journey of discovery and strengthening in your personal life. So we're going to close with a hymn. And... Uh, Uh, Don't forget, you can have a look at the books and the guys around there 
We've got a, a hymn which will be immortal, invisible, God only wise. And we'll be standing up to sing that. And I enjoy hearing your voices. You sing so well. So let's go. Good on you, Amy. Let's receive a blessing. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with you this week. May your homes be blessed. May you experience good health in your body. May you receive success in your endeavours and all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>